A quick note before we get started. This past week, my mom passed away. She was 86 years old and she'd had a difficult year. In the past year, she'd had pneumonia and in the middle of December, a series of strokes. She's been retired for many years, but for most of her life, she was a high school teacher and a resource specialist. She often worked one-on-one -on -one with students who faced learning challenges, helping them not only to graduate from high school, but often to go on to college. Six years ago, I was pretty sure we were going to lose her when she had a blood clot in her brain. At that time, she drove herself over to my sister's, where after seeing that she was having trouble speaking, my sister took her to the hospital. The prognosis at that time wasn't great, with surgery and weeks in the ICU. But she recovered, went through a physical rehabilitation program, and returned home. And she made it six more years. And those were good years. She gave up driving and, until the pandemic, traveled on the train or with Lyft. During the early months of the pandemic, she video chatted with our family every Friday night. For years, I've called her every morning at 8.30 a.m., right after I dropped the kids off at school, and she often tried to convince me that she'd been awake for hours. Over time, as the years added up, she stayed at home more. She lived about 250 miles away from me and my family. I saw her at least once a month, sometimes more. And for most of this past month, I stayed at her house, where I visited her in the hospital and then in a nursing home, where eventually she passed, two days before Christmas. I have nothing smart or wise to say about any of this, other than, even though she was 86 and had been in declining health for a while, her passing still feels unexpected and leaves a big hole not only in my life, but in the life of our family. Over the past week, I've mostly been thinking of those six years after her brain surgery, as those were something extra, like gravy that wasn't expected. She was different after surgery, perhaps as she believed her time was now short. She was deeply focused on family, especially on the grandkids. During these years, she traveled with us up north and repeatedly to Florida. And I feel very grateful that we got that time. Usually, at the start of the year, I post up an episode about the January where Walt was the Grand Marshal for the Pasadena Tournament of Roses Parade. Over the years, it's been updated and expanded. I typically put this episode up a few days before New Year's. But this year, it's going up today, on January 1st, as I simply haven't been able to put together a new episode this week. I do plan to return with our monthly news and analysis episode next Sunday, although it may be on the short side. But until then, here is Walt's last new year, and also my wish that the new year is good to us all. As we move to the end of the holidays, we have one last seasonal episode to share. It's an episode recently updated, expanded, and re-recorded from our early years that for a few days were shuffling to the top of our feed. An episode on Walt's last new year. Let me set it up for you. Throughout his professional life, Walt Disney participated in the Pasadena Rose Parade. The company's tradition of preview marketing and the parade goes back to 1938, when the first Disney feature-related float was included in the parade. Though Snow White had premiered 10 days earlier in the middle of December 1937, the film wouldn't go into a general release until February 8th. As such, Disney arranged an elaborate and costly float to be featured in the parade as a type of promotion. Though one might think the parade in a pre-television era enjoyed an audience only of local Californians, that wasn't true. The parade was regularly featured in magazines, newspapers, and various theatrical newsreels throughout the country and even overseas. Marge Champion, the live-action movement model for Snow White, was featured on the float along with the Seven Dwarves. Two years later, a month before Pinocchio premiered in New York, Disney created a Rose Parade float to promote that release as well. 
Compared to the Snow White float, the effort on Pinocchio was more subdued, featuring only a floral figure of the wooden puppet in front of a giant star marked with the year 1940. During the Second World War, the Rose Parade was placed on hiatus. Instead of a floral parade, the tournament committee opted to focus on events to help the war effort, such as a bond drive. The tournament still selected a queen, but her presentation was shifted wholly over to the Rose Bowl football game. As such, the studio produced no floats, aside, of course, from Pinocchio, for its early 1940s features, such as Fantasia, Bambi, and Saludos Amigos. But after the war, Disney returned to the parade. During the late 1940s, when the studio wasn't producing true feature-length animation, they created two floats featuring Mickey and Donald, including one in 1948 in which the mouse piloted a steam train with a mechanical Donald chattering away on top of a coal car. In 1949, shortly after the release of Melody Time, the parade featured Little Toot, a float that was likely designed with some help from Disney. Disney. One of the most unique and perhaps most famous studio entries in the parade was the 1955 Helms Bakery float that featured a preview of Disneyland. By January 1, 1955, the American public had seen models of Disneyland on Walt's weekly TV show. But for local residents, the parade was the first time they saw a colorful dimensional representation of the park. On the float was Mickey Mouse, a character who actually wouldn't have a regular presence at the park until 1959. The float featured the castle and the aerial balloon that was included in both Herb Ryman's and John Hench's early bird's eye conceptual maps of Disneyland. The one ride featured was the Dumbo Flying Elephant attraction. And then, after 1955, the studio removed itself from the parade for years. In the months leading up to New Year's Day, 1966, the president of the Tournament of Roses Association, Randy Richards, faced a unique challenge. For the past three years, Telstar satellites possessed the capability of transmitting television signals around the world, though actual use of a satellite signal for TV broadcast was limited. The Telstar satellites then circling the globe were a joint project between NASA and Bell Labs with international arrangements with the UK and France. Ground stations were built in the US, France, Canada, the UK, Germany, and Italy. Aside from video relay, the Telstar system performed other functions, such as transmitting telephone conversations between heads of state, sending computer data between mainframes, measuring radiation from tests of high-altitude nuclear bombs, and performing various scientific tests. As such, use of the satellite system for worldwide television broadcasts was limited to important international events, such as the 1964 Summer Olympics in Tokyo. Early in 1965, discussions between Telstar and the Tournament of Roses focused on the possibility of using the Telstar system to broadcast the 1966 Rose Parade overseas. As opposed to relaying programming arranged in the U.S. during the evening, a live broadcast of a California event staged in the morning would present the parade at a favorable time overseas, particularly in Western Europe, at 5 p.m. in London and 6 p.m. in France. Because of the favorable time slot, the Telstar Group had previously tried to telecast the parade in 1963, shortly after the deployment of Telstar 1, an 18-minute segment of the parade. But late in December 1962, the broadcast was scrubbed when, quote, the communication satellite developed switch troubles. In the years following the 1963 mishap, Bell Labs, with increased satellite support, had increased the quality and reliability of the satellite broadcasts. 
Initial estimates were that with a satellite broadcast, the 1966 live presentation would reach 96 million viewers, an estimate that was later revised up to 100 million. There was only one catch. Quote, Officials of the National Broadcast Company and Columbia Broadcasting Systems told Richards that the arrangement would be possible if the Grand Marshal were a well-known person, one easily recognizable and admired throughout Europe. The Telstar Group likely meant that the Grand Marshal would need to be more internationally recognizable than recent parade selections, such as Bill Pickering in 1963, the head of the locally-based JPL, and Albert Rossellini in 1962, governor of Washington. Up until this point, the tournament had typically looked to civic and political figures to lead the parade, such as generals, chief justices, Medal of Honor winners, presidents of local university systems, company presidents, and people in public office. Tournament officials had not successfully engaged a true Hollywood celebrity in nearly two decades, not since Bob Hope led the parade way back in 1947. Unlike other celebrities, Walt Disney had a multi-decade history with the parade, having produced floats to promote its various animated features and characters. With this, early in 1965, Richards approached Walt Disney to see if he'd be willing to be the parade's grand marshal, a request that would expand the prestige of the parade and also secure an international satellite relay of the broadcast. In a note dated March 3, 1965, the tournament committee expressed that Walt was, quote, the one person no country could find fault with. Richards would later expand the statement to say that Walt, quote, is known by more people around the world than any other individual. Today on the podcast, we have the story of Walt's last New Year's parade, the day in 1966 where he returned to the parade as Grand Marshal as it moved down Colorado Boulevard. Enjoy. Here's the part of the story that most people know. On January 1st, 1966, as Grand Marshal for the Tournament of Roses Parade, Walt began his day early, very early, with a trip to the Wrigley Mansion to meet with the press and take photos. For the previous few years, the Wrigley Mansion, which had been donated to the city, served as the headquarters for the Tournament of Roses and was also the focal point for pre-parade activities. As Rose Parade Queen Carol Coda recalls, quote, Inside the toasty warm Tournament of Roses Wrigley Mansion, my royal court of rose princesses and I were positioned in the living room in front of the welcoming fireplace with our Grand Marshal Walt Disney, set to begin more official photos. We had all arrived at 3 a.m., and I was joking with him after we were served just one ounce of orange juice to hold us over for the five-mile, two-hour rose parade. The events at the Wrigley Mansion lasted a few hours until sunrise burned across the horizon and revealed a few doughy clouds pressed into the sky. Coda remembers, quote, As we descended down the winding driveway to our respectful positions in the parade lineup and being met by throngs of reporters and photographers, Walt Disney shared with me that he only agreed to be Grand Marshal on one condition, that all of his Disney characters could accompany him on the parade route while circling his official rose-covered Grand Marshal's car. The parade began shortly after 8, a little earlier than initially planned. Though the crowd was expecting rain and dressed for it, the day was cold but sunny. NBC and CBS cameras broadcast the event to millions across the United States, and for the first time, Telstar satellites relayed the signals to stations in Western Europe, presenting the unique festivities of a Southern California New Year's Day tradition to millions across the Atlantic. Leading the parade, Walt rode alongside his best-known creation, Mickey Mouse, rather than following the tradition of including family members in the Grand Marshal's car. 
That day, the mouse was played by Paul Castle, the person Walt believed best portrayed the mouse in costume. Castle was often the suit actor when the mouse accompanied Walt to special events, such as the opening of Anaheim Stadium. But 22 years later, Castle would claim that this event was his favorite moment with Walt. Quote, he was the Grand Marshal of the Rose Parade, Castle said, and I was in the car with him in the back seat. Just Walt and I for three hours. Just Walt and I. Of all the things I've done in my lifetime, that to me was my biggest day. The Grand Marshal's car was followed by the Burbank City Float, keyed to the theme of our small world of make-believe. The concept for the float was assigned to longtime Disney artist Bill Justice. Quote, The task of designing a float for the city of Burbank to accompany Walt fell to me, Justice explained. The float encompassed three themes central to the studio's identity. First, the frame structure for the float was an open book, indicating the importance of story. Second, the visual centerpiece was a large musical clef, indicating the importance of song. And last, the unit was backframed with a painter's palette, indicating the importance of art. But Walt Disney Productions itself didn't build the float. Quote, Burbank's float is always constructed by city employees, Justice added, from the water and power plants. As with most parade entries, it was decorated by hand with over 100,000 flowers, orchids and chrysanthemums in particular. To accompany the float, Disney stepped in to provide talent. Quote, naturally, Justice said, it had to include many Disney characters. For the parade, roughly two dozen Disney character costumes were borrowed from the entertainment division at Disneyland. Many Disney characters walked, but a few rode on the float. Beyond the fully costumed characters, a national contest was held to find young women to play face characters, such as Snow White, Cinderella, and Mary Poppins. Quote, the winners, Justice explained, were flown to Burbank to the Orange County Airport in our company's plane and driven by limo to Disney. Disneyland to be fitted for their costumes. Halfway down the five-mile parade route, the characters who walked were switched out with fresh actors in costumes, as a five-mile trek, even in winter, was considered too difficult for a costume troupe to complete. Earlier that year, Walt had been selected as Grand Marshal because, according to Randy Richard, the president of the 77th Tournament of Roses, he represented the goodwill and globalism that the parade hoped to embody. He was a Grand Marshal who would instantly be recognizable to viewers in Europe who, for the first time, were tuning in to watch the parade as it was televised in real time in the UK, France, Germany, and elsewhere across the western portion of the continent. Quote, and Walt, Richards continued, we have a man whose name is a byword in nearly every household in the world. He is without doubt the most famous and respected man in the history of entertainment. The theme of the parade was It's a Small World, a theme plucked from one of the attractions that Disney had recently developed for the New York World's Fair, an attraction that would soon open as an expanded and enhanced presentation at Walt's Park in Anaheim. The parade's logo that year, based on Disney art used for the fair, was created at the studio and given to the tournament committee, further cementing the visual connection between Disney and the 1966 parade. When a reporter asked Walt why he hadn't previously been Grand Marshal, he responded politely, quote, I was always busy, and then you have to meet so many people. But in the weeks leading up to the parade, he'd taken on the full responsibilities and met with hundreds, if not thousands, of people in his role as Grand Marshal. He attended the participants' dinner on December 2nd and the Queen's breakfast on December 21st, both held at the Huntington Hotel in Pasadena. He invited the Rose Queen, tournament officials, and the Pasadena Junior Chamber of Commerce to the studio for a private tour and photo session on December 6th. As was now the custom at Disneyland, he invited the two football teams and the Rose Court to a special event at his park. With thousands in attendance and millions more watching the parade on TV in the U.S., Canada, Mexico, and Europe, Walt rode down Colorado Boulevard in a white Chrysler convertible. With Mickey seated beside him, he was a representative of the California entertainment industry. He was also a representative 
of a growing philosophy of post-Cold War internationalism and optimism, a philosophy that Walt promoted in his films, TV shows, and parks. This philosophy, as embodied by Disney toward the end of his life, might be best exemplified by the phrase, quote, peace through cultural understanding. The direct connections to the Disney studio were focused at the start of the parade, but were not limited to the opening units. Elsewhere in the parade were individuals associated, but not officially representing Walt Disney Productions. Fess Parker, dressed as Davy Crockett, spearheaded the National Rifle Association's entry, Land of the Free, Home of the Brave. And Art Linkletter, who had hosted both the 1955 opening and the 1959 second opening of Disneyland for ABC, rode with his grandchildren atop the Farmers Insurance Group's float, Aladdin's World of Magic. For most Disney fans, the story ends here. With Walt's efforts as both a producer of family entertainment and an ambassador of global goodwill acknowledged before an admiring public. But Walt's day did not end with the parade. After the morning parade, Walt was driven to the Kiwanis Club luncheon at the Pasadena Civic Auditorium to kick off that afternoon's Rose Bowl football festivities. During that event, along with the football coaches and the Tournament of Roses Queen, he briefly appeared on local TV and joyfully talked with journalists. As reporters asked him about his interest in the game, Walt joked around, explaining that he was a local boy at heart and therefore a fan of the UCLA Bruins, who faced off that afternoon against the Michigan State Spartans. When asked if he had any advice for the Bruins, he said simply, quote, Flubber Gas, a reference to a 1963 Disney film, The Son of Flubber, which included an extended comedic sequence involving a college football game. Quote, what you do, he chuckled, is to fill the ball with flubbergast. Give it to the quarterback, then pass the quarterback instead of the ball. Then if there is an interception, UCLA would still have the ball. The good mood continued as he explained his connection to the university. Though he himself had never completed high school, UCLA had once given him an honorary doctorate degree in the fine arts. Or as one reporter put it, quote, Disney mentioned an honorary degree of some sort from UCLA as the primary reason for holding the Bruins, quote, close to my heart. From there, Walt explained that he was originally a fan of the USC team, where he was once the president of a booster organization called the USC Trojaneers. When asked what the Trojaneers were, he dryly quipped, quote, It's composed of men who didn't go to college who give jobs to those who did, athletes in particular. And this perfectly explained the management of WED and Disneyland in the mid-1960s, an organization who had hired a large number of USC football alums and transformed them into managers, including Dick Nunes, Orlando Ferrante, Tommy Walker, and Walt's son-in-law, Ron Miller. Once the press event wrapped up, Walt continued to watch the football game as a VIP guest in the stadium. Tournament of Roses Queen Carol Coda remembers that, quote, Mr. Disney sat directly behind me on the 50-yard line at the Rose Bowl game and was cheering for the UCLA Bruins. The program, which Walt held throughout the game, included artwork produced by the studio. Both cover art representing various collegiate teams in cartoon form and internal comics featuring Disney characters such as Donald Duck humorously engaged in the sport. In the end, Walt's chosen team, UCLA, won. After the game, Walt returned to a temporary home on the other side of town as his own house was being remodeled. In reviewing the events of this day, I'm reminded of two things. First, Walt attended a large number of prestigious events by himself in the 1950s and 1960s without his family, including the opening of Disneyland. Though his wife Lillian was often his companion in the 1930s and 1940s, by the 1950s, Walt was becoming an individual icon, with his family and work experiences often isolated from each other. During the 1966 Tournament of Roses parade, the Disneys were expecting a new grandchild, 
which was one of the reasons why Lillian declined to attend. But four days after the parade, Walt gave a more direct answer as to how his public and private lives had separated. When a reporter asked about the matter, Walt explained that the remodeling work on his home was, quote, very upsetting. But I have nothing to say about this home project. That's her business. She doesn't interfere with mine, and I do the same by her. And second, though Walt didn't yet know that cancer was building inside his lungs, surely it was there, the mass arranged as a tumor. His good mood and energy would endure for another five or six months. By midsummer, he would be short on breath, clearly ill. That fall, part of his lung would be removed. In late September, at the request of the Tournament of Roses Committee, Walt issued a statement about his experience in the parade. The statement reads in part, quote, it was a distinct honor to be chosen Grand Marshal of the 77th Tournament of Roses Parade. This thrilling experience gave me a feeling of being surrounded by friends, not only those from this country, but also the world over. But as with many public statements issued near the end of his life, this one wasn't actually written by Walt himself, rather by head studio publicist Joe Reddy. It was reviewed by Walt and hand-signed with his OK. But that famous trip down Colorado Boulevard would be his final New Year's Day. He was Grand Marshal for the Rose Parade. He was honored with his own float. His image was seen on TVs around the world. No one yet realizing that Mr. Disney was sick that the year he started with such exuberance would also be his last.